Now, we've been talking about macroevolution, which is the process of generation of a new species from an original species, or the change in a species into a different species. And we talked about how it's crucial for this process that there be isolation. Isolation is going to guarantee that one group is going to develop separately from the other across many generations. Now, of course, in order for this to happen, different things have to happen in different groups. Maybe one group experienced genetic drift when the other did not. Maybe one group received different pressures from the environment, so the selection pressure was different. So natural selection was different. Maybe one group uh, had more mutations than the other did. So each one of those things we talked about in the microevolution lecture series, if those things happen independently, separately, in each of the separated groups, that is what's ultimately, over time, as those changes accumulate, are going to change the differentiation between the groups and then the formation of the different species. But remember, in order for this to happen, you have to have isolation. And we did a whole set of videos... And we did a whole set of videos on that when we talked about uh, pre-sexual and post-sexual isolation or pre-zygotic or post-zygotic isolation or different ways in which population therefore be categorized as different species. And then we also talk about different types of speciation methods. And we talk about the fact that this process can happen by actual physical separation. You know, there's actual something that separates them from each other so they cannot even interact with each other. Or it could be sympatric speciation, which happens within the same ecosystem, or, but when there's a different niche that's being explored or a different set of genes or a chromosomal change or something that causes the population to change significantly from the other and therefore they evolve separately from each other. But whichever way you look at it, divergent evolution, which is evolution where two different species will start from one or where the new species will branch out of a, of a, of a parent species, will only occur if there is isolation. Now remember, to understand this, you have to again refresh the idea that a population is a group of organisms that's living in the same certain area that all interact with each other. Now, as long as there's gene flow, in other words, there's exchange of genes within the members of the population and they can continue to do sexual reproduction and successively create offspring, they're considered the same population. And sometimes you can even look at this as a meta population. Many populations that live but still, there's a lot of migration or gene exchange or gene flow is what we call it, right, between these populations. And that's what you see at the beginning of this graph. As long as that's maintained, you're going to homogenize the populations. The genes are going to be continue to exchange between the populations. And everybody's pretty much going to be the same because the genes are going to flow from one to the other. So even if there are mutations that occur only in one specific part of the population, they will spread across all the populations or all the pieces of the meta population as long as gene flow is possible. That is why isolation is key. You've got to separate the groups. Now, once a barrier is in place and that stops the gene flow, you know, it could be a physical barrier, a temporal barrier, a behavioral barrier, ecological barrier, a genetic barrier, uh, be whatever you call it. When a barrier is actually in place, then the process of speciation will take place. It could be allopatric, sympatric, whatever we talked about. Then the populations will develop separately from each other so long as different things happen in each one. So maybe on the C on the one on top, for example, the divergence is happening because the gene flow stopped in the top, so that particular group is now going to develop separately. Maybe a mountain range between them. Maybe a new genetic difference or the chromosomal abnormality that makes that population be incapable of reproducing with the one that's below. Maybe some two different species merge together to make another one. Whatever's happening there that created such a big difference or such a big physical separation that makes the population on top unable to exchange genes with the population at the bottom. Now, then maybe genetic drift will happen on top but not in the bottom. Maybe natural selection will be different on the top than in the bottom. The environment conditions will be different. Maybe mutations happen on the top that did not happen in the bottom. Over long periods of time in many, many generations, these changes that only happen in one but not the other will cause the populations to change so much from each other that if later on the barrier is removed, and that's what you see at the end of the graph, and the populations are again allowed to interchange genes, they may be sufficiently different from each other that they are now considered different species and they can no longer be produced. Now, remember, this is especially interesting when you're talking about allopatric speciation because you know, it's actual physical separation. And then maybe there's a little area where the species can still interact with each other. Or, but it gets even more interesting when you're talking about sympatric speciation because the two species are living in the same spot. And so it's going to take something like uh, a niche that's being explored or a different sexual selection or polyploidy or other kinds of genetic or, or chromosomal abnormalities that will happen in one group but not the other in order for the populations to diverge from each other. But whichever way you separated them, the key is... Once separated, enough time 
and enough generations in between will have to occur where they are not interacting with each other in order for that uh, evolution to take place. Now, the key interesting thing here, though, is that there may be still a little bit of interaction between the two of them. And that is what we refer to as we call the hybrid zone. Now, the hybrid zone is basically an area that either after the, the divergence took place or even during the divergence took place, the species can still interact with each other. So uh, sometimes, the, for the most part, they're separated, but there's still a little bit of overlap between the populations, all right? This is especially the case when we're talking about sympatric speciation. Um, uh, but even with actual physical separation, sometimes there's a little corner of the habitat where the species can still interact. That is what we call the hybrid zone. Now, interesting things will happen in that hybrid zone uh, in terms of evolution. And that's why it's important to talk about it. Because whenever the species are interchanging genes, if there's enough difference between them, that say they can't have really children with each other, may say a behavioral, ecological, temporal uh, difference, a mechanical difference, a gametic difference, genetic difference, or... Maybe there is, you know, too much of high zygote mortality. The the survival of the of the offspring is not good enough, or maybe the offspring can't reproduce. That's the whole hybrid fertility thing. Or maybe uh, they breaks down over periods of time. If there's enough separation between them and they can't really uh, talk to each other, then you're gonna get what is called reinforcement. And that's when the populations diverge so much from each other that even if there is a hybrid zone and they try to interchange genes. They're not going to successfully be able to do so because now the species are too different from each other already. And we're going to do examples of that in a second. The other possible outcome is that they're still similar enough that they can kind of maybe interact with each other and exchange genes. But that the hybrid is not necessarily uh, less viable than either of the, of the species which are trying to, to combine now. So that means that they all have equal chances of survival, especially in the hybrid zone. That means that the hybrid is going to continuously be made, and that's the whole stability thing. See, if the hybrid has a disadvantage, and that's for all the different things I just talked about, you know, then it's going to be reinforcement because this hybrid is impossible. So you're not going to have that happen. There's a, a selection against the hybrid because the hybrid is going to die more often, it's not going to survive, it's not going to have children, and so forth. But if the hybrid has equal chances of surviving, especially in the hybrid zone, then you're going to have continuous formation of the hybrid whenever the two species interact with each other. And then you're going to have three species instead of uh, just two. You're going to have the parent species, the new species that diverge, and then a new species is just the hybrid being formed. All right? Now, if the hybrid actually has a bigger advantage than either of the parent species, then what ends up happening is what we call fusion. And that's when the hybrid uh, is actually better than either of the parent species or the new species. And that means that the advantage is going to be the hybrid. And so all you have left is the hybrid over time, and that's fusion. So we're going to talk about each of these examples so you can see that once the actual diversion evolution takes place, and then you have a, a little hybrid zone left there in between them, or even after the separation that used to exist no longer exists, whichever way, that hybrid zone, interesting things will happen in it. So let's talk about that hybrid zone, all right? So now, one example of a hybrid zone, for example, is what the, the, in between Europe and Asia, there's a group of mountain ranges where uh, certain species of amphibians live. Now, the ones that live in low altitudes uh, of this are called fire-bellied toads, and they have um, orange bottoms, like really reddish orange bottles, bottoms. Now, the ones that are living in the high altitudes, they are different toads, and they actually have a yellow belly, all right, toads. Now, there's an area in middle altitudes where there's a hybrid zone that exists between the two of them, all right? Now, what's interesting about this hybrid zone is that in the yellow habitat, which is a high altitude, only the yellow is advantageous. So, that means... A long time ago, there used to be only one of these kinds of toads, right? But then, one of these toads migrated to the higher altitudes, and in that environment, which is different from the low-altitude environment, conditions for natural selection were different. New mutations took place that did not happen in the low-altitude, and because the toads were kind of isolated, kind of isolated from each other, a, a different population that was exploring the niche of the high altitude evolved. So you got, now you have this yellow belly uh, toad in the high altitudes. Meanwhile, the population that was in the low altitude evolved to the fire belly toad. So you have these two different zones, right? So that's what we talked about before, the divergent evolution. But then, successively, the middle, in between them, there was still some interchange. That's, that's a hybrid zone in the middle altitudes where some toads for the fire belly and orange belly can reproduce with each other. And in that area, 
kind of the hybrid can kind of survive. And so what you end up getting is the stability scenario where you have both of the species, each match for their environments that are different, and at the same time you also have their hybrid in the middle because the hybrid gets to survive. You know, the hybrid, there's, an, there's not enough uh, disadvantage for the hybrid and because there's continuously opportunity for the populations to, to uh, interchange genes in that hybrid zone since there, there's still going to be some red-bellied toads and yellow-bellied toads uh, living in that hybrid zone, so they're still going to be interchanging genes. So you end up getting those three species, the hybrids and the two species that were separated from each other. So stability is going to happen whenever you have a situation where uh, there's advantages for all three kinds in all three kinds of environment. This is very common in those ectonomes, which are areas in between habitats. So that's why, again, ectonomes help increase biodiversity because it's an area of gene flow where it allows two different populations to sometimes merge and form completely new populations without destroying the original populations. So that ends up creating more variety in the ecosystem. Another example of this is going to be when you have reinforcement. Now, let's say, for example, you have in a, a sympatric population, uh, you evolve two different kinds of birds that look completely different from each other. Now, this is obviously going to be very common in sympatric populations when you're exploring different niches. So you have the whole character displacement thing. So now you know, the females are choosing between the males, but notice that in the sympatric population, the males of the different species looking completely different from each other because it's the best way for them to make sure that they're not competing for the females. So they're going to be avoiding each other by looking completely different from each other. So be to, because they're in the same habitat, there's pressure for them to avoid looking like the, each other, so avoid the niche. So neither really looks like each other. So you got the formation of those two different kinds of males. But that, that means is that the females don't really make as many mistakes and, you know, and, and confuse the different types of males. So what's ended up happening is the females of one species are going to choose that species, and the, and the females of the other species are going to tend to choose that species. So there's going to be mechanical, behavioral, and even you know uh, actual choice of mate. There's going to be mate choice. So the, the females are going to be better at choosing the males of their own species because they look different from each other, right? Now what that's going to end up happening is that it's going to reduce the amount of hybrids because the hybrids are going to be rare since there's going to be a disadvantage for the formation of them since the females tend to prefer mating with their own for their own species. So what ends up happening is reinforcement or the creation of two completely different looks within a population because the two different niches are being explored and that's reinforcement. Now notice that in the allopatric population when they did not compete for the same niche and therefore they both look the same. Uh, when you get the females from one side of the mountains and the other side of the mountains and you try to uh, put them in the same environment, the females are not as good as identifying the uh, different species because they look the same. And so in that scenario, you're not going to have as much of that. But what you see on the left side with the St. Patrick population is an example of reinforcement where the species are being separated because they look different and because mate choice is reinforcing the two different species. And that's an example of reinforcement, all right? Another example that you could have is going to be the fusion. Now, a good example of that is the cyclids that we talked about before, the, the two different kinds of fish that live in the lake in Lake Victoria. And because of sexual selection, they evolve these different color patterns, right? Now, those cyclids will actually sometimes accidentally merge, uh, especially in the murky waters where they cannot really tell the color pattern that was actually created because of the selection but in the murky waters, where they can't really tell each other apart too well, they sometimes will mate with each other. So in that hybrid zone, where the water is murky, and what ends up happening is the creation of a new species, which is a hybrid offspring of both of them. So that the water is turbid, and you can't really tell the difference, you're going to have that happening. And a new species evolves before the merging of two other species, because there was yet enough similarity between the two different divergent species that they could possibly mate successfully. You see the same thing with polar bears and grizzly bears in, air, in hybrid zones or the habitats between the two of them and in some butterflies as well and several examples actually in the wild that we discussed we did evidence of for macroevolution where there's a formation of hybrids because there are enough similarity between the plants or between the animals that they can actually hybridize and form uh, new species this is called fusion and if there's an advantage for the survival of that within the hybrid zone then you're going to have uh, preservation of the hybrid as opposed to either one of the parent species so those are the examples of hybrid zones and, and, and why they fit with evolution. And I hope that's clear. See you in the next video.